Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution of the United States. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this program. And here he is, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Thank you, Bob Kincaid, and welcome to another week of our program, our time together on the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution. I'm Bill O'Brien, and it is a pleasure to be with you again on this, the first day of another week, uh, first day of July. We're midway through the year, are, are we not? And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to, to look forward to, very honestly, over the weekend. I start to get, get a little bit antsy and a little bit excited, a little bit nervous, and I've always tried to tell myself that uh, that being a little bit nervous is good when you when you when you do something like this I always said that it forever uh, all the years that I was teaching uh, the day you walk into the classroom and aren't a little bit nervous that's the day it's time to start thinking about do, doing something else <clears throat> because what it seems to me what what you're doing is very very important and therefore it's very serious and it's worth worrying a bit about and uh, that's the way I look at our time together. It's a, it's a challenge, but at the same time, it's one of the most incredible opportunities I've ever had in my life. And, and I appreciate very, very much uh, the willingness of you folks to tune in on a regular basis and, and uh, to, to reflect upon uh, some of the key issues associated with the political system in which we live and the opportunities that it provides for all of us. Uh, where that uh, where that ideal is successful and where that ideal uh, needs quite a bit of work before we before we make it and uh, that's really what we're about we're, we're talking about the Constitution of the United States but more important not just as it existed in the 18th century but as it affects our day-to-day -day lives today uh, I look forward to hearing from you. We would love to have you participate actively in our program by giving us a call. Uh, our number is area code 304-658-3333. That's 304-658-3333. My email address, if you'd like to email direct me directly, and, and a number of people have. I have one uh, listener out there who uh, regularly sends me interesting uh emails and, and, and links and websites that that he has found interesting that he thought that I would benefit from and that the program would benefit from and I, I so appreciate that 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 that's really something that, uh, that that I that I don't take for granted at all and I will be very honest with uh, with you I uh, uh, the last email I got from him was a list of websites on some fairly scholarly papers I looked at three this morning and uh, they were scholarly papers done in law school journals I plan to read them all and uh, uh, and, and I, I'm very very appreciative of the opportunity and I'm most appreciative of the fact that the person who sent me the link uh, thought enough of the program and and uh, uh, and enough of me that uh, uh, that he thought it was something that I would be interested in and I would take the time to look at and I, I wanted to assure him that I will indeed do that. My email address is waobrian906 at, e at gmail.com. That's waobrian, O-B-R-I-E-N, 906 at gmail.com. This will kind of be a lead into today's program, but I, I, I want to share with you uh, a... Uh, exactly where we are over the last 24 hours. Uh, just uh, 24 hours ago, yesterday afternoon, we experienced the, the third and last of our interactive chat sessions on our PRISM West Virginia grant program. And we were on the air yesterday here on the Head On Radio Network um, from... 3 to 5 p.m. Actually, we kind of ran to almost to 5.30, but we, we were on for about better than two hours, about two hours and 15 minutes. And I understand that there was a little bit of Internet uh, problem, uh, some Internet issues, and we're not really sure how successful we were for those that were trying to follow the program live on, 
on the internet. It was uh, aud- it was not only audio, but it was also also video. So we were we were on uh, you know uh, video br- uh, simulcasting on the uh, on the internet, and we had a, a few issues. I understand, but we did uh, capture the program, and uh, when we put it on the archives, it will be uh, it, it will be a complete program. I couldn't begin today's program without a few a few comments about that grant program because for the last four years we have been immersed in that program. Uh, and when I say we, I don't just mean me, but I mean Keith Lilly, who does the chat sessions with me, Margaret Ramsey, who's been been kind of handling all the paperwork and all the logistics. Um, of the program, of the grant program since it began. Uh, she's probably the one that most of us have to have to thank if we got paid on time or even close to be on time. And of course, Bob Kincaid and his folks here at Head On who have been broadcasting the chats. And I, I will say very, very honestly that that the, the idea of the chats were not even part of the plan. They are not part of the original grant, uh, but because it was an online class and because I heard nothing but negative comments about keeping people engaged in the process in an online situation because students, enrolled students, are kind of out there all by themselves with no contact to the grant or to me or to each or to other students in the program or whatever. So. I came up with the idea that if we could figure out a way to, to do live chats on the Internet on a regular basis, it would be beneficial to the students, especially if we spent the time addressing the issues of the course and the issues that they were being held responsible for, because these were college credit, university credit graduate courses. And we tried it uh, in 2010, 2011. And 2011, 2012, in the summer of 2011, we ran, uh, we tried it. We had, we we put the entire summer academy program live here on Head On Radio Network. We did we did live broadcasts of all of our presenters through the entire summer academy program. And then in the fall, starting in September, when we began our first graduate class on the founding. We introduced the idea of the chats in order to keep the enrolled teachers connected to the program. And the first class ran the entire academic year from September through the following May. And the very first semester in the fall, we did two or three chats. And they seemed to be very helpful at least what we were hearing from our teachers was, was that they were helpful. And in a sense, it was a successful experiment. So we decided over the holidays that we would increase the number of chats in the spring. So whereas we had three in the fall, I think we did maybe four in the spring, up into between February, uh, J- late January and May. And what happened as a result of those chats is incredible. It was not in the original grant. It was not in the cards. And that was that many of the regular listeners on Head On began to tune into the chats and began to participate actively in them through emails. We had live inter- you know, live internet. We had a chat room all the time we were doing the chats. And we, we were getting emails from people all over the world about the chats with questions, comments, observations, or whatever. And so, in a sense, what we started to do was build an audience outside the parameters of the original grant. Besides the teachers for which the grant was written, we developed this whole other clientele of interested participants that came to us predominantly through the the head-on radio network and the total number of people that was that that were tuning in to our chat sessions 
continued to grow and grow and grow until it became so substantial that you could not plan for the rest of the grant without taking that new audience into consideration. And so we did that. So in a sense, one of the things that was most exciting about the grant to me was that we found ourselves planning and revisiting things we thought we had nailed down because we realized we had a whole audience out there that we hadn't planned upon, that hadn't planned on at all. And the way we scheduled the chats and the way we, we organized our time, we began to realize that we could not just talk, speak directly to our own teachers because that would not only be insulting, but it would pretty much drive away anybody who was watch who was tuned into the chats and was not a, a part of the program. Fact of the matter is then, when we came to the second year of the grant in 2011 and 2012, we, we scheduled the chats as a key part of the syllabus. When the graduate courses were designed and developed, they included chats. And in, in 20, fall 2011 and spring 2012, we built six chats into the fall semester and six chats into the spring semester. So we had a total of 12 over the entire academic year of the second course. Actually, we had our, teach our teachers were enrolled in two courses simultaneously. The ones who were not with us the first year were taking both the course in Pillars, which was the class on the founding, and our first year teachers didn't have to do that because they had already taken it during the first year. But then in the second year we did a course on 19th century America, which included principally, uh, you know, the, the, the Jefferson administration, the War of 1812, the uh, administration of Andrew Jackson, the onset of the Civil War, and the, the whole idea of Reconstruction, and the Industrial Revolution, which kind of took over the country in the late 19th century. Everybody had to take, all of our teachers had to take that course. So that's really what necessitated the, the six chats each semester, because what we were doing was alternating. We would do a chat one week on the founding, for the students that were taking teacher for people that was teachers that were taking that course, and then two weeks later, you know, next week or the week after that, we would do a, a session on the 19th century, which would appeal to everybody in the program, those that were taking just the 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 that class and new teachers who were taking both courses simultaneously. And we did that through the fall of 2011, uh, uh, 2012, and actually into the spring of uh, 2011 to 2012, and we did the same thing in 2012, 2013. So the point is that w we had a very substantial audience uh, that, in effect, became a key factor in how we presented our chats because we, again, we could not just direct our entire presentation to the enrolled teachers because we knew we had literally hundreds of people out there. And this one's much free. We had hundreds much of free. people out there. Really? And this one beats when you leave the door open. Get those brand name bells and whistles with red, white, and blue savings. Thank you. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. We had somebody, uh, we just had a Home Depot commercial in the middle of the presentation. So to continue, um, so in a sense what I'm suggesting, is, what I'm saying is that the head-on folks became a key factor in the planning of the program. And so we did six chats in the fall of 2011 and six chats in the spring of 2012. Then when we got to the academic year of 2012 and 2013, the last academic year, we, we built in seven chats in the fall and seven chats in the spring. And what our teacher suggested was that rather than do two courses over the entire academic year simultaneously, they found that difficult. So what they asked us to do was break it up. Well, we did one class in the fall, 
of 2012 and then a totally separate class in the spring of 2013. So that's what we do, did. We had seven chats scheduled in the fall around a course that we did on constitutional, uh, American constitutional development, the whole idea of the court and the interpretation of the Constitution from the, from the early years of the founding all the way up through the contemporary, through the Roberts Court. And then in the spring, as many of you know who are tuned in today, we did a, sec we did a course on American foreign policy. And our last chat in May, we were privileged to have with us Jeremy Surrey from the University of Texas in Austin, who focused on his book on nation building as a key ingredient of America's foreign policy priorities. And we entertained that, we, we, we entertained that process. And then this summer, from the 1st of June until now, just the, the, the four weeks, we did the fifth class in this PRISM program, which was on leadership. And the focus on leadership, and I, I kind of want to do some of that today because it's so embedded in my mind after this weekend. But if, if, you know, if there are folks out there who are listening today that, that weren't in the chats, uh, and if, if there's some out there who did listen to the chat yesterday, uh, then some of this might be review, but if, if it is, I, I apologize. Um, but anyway, we did leadership, and of course what we were looking for was the extent to which the ideas and the values and the principles and the um, intent of the founders continued to be effective, continued to be enforced, not only throughout the history of the nation, but also uh, involved in the whole idea of leadership. In other words, what we were looking at was the extent to which leadership in our society today is a function of the historical reality of where we of who we are and where we came from as a as a nation. In other words, the extent to which the ideas and the values and the principles and the intent of the founders informs leadership in such a way that in our political system as it currently functions leadership takes on its own meaning its own unique meaning and for that and I've mentioned this in in, in the previous programs I know for a textbook we used James McGregor Burns award-winning book on leadership which uh, I, I've, I've mentioned before, but I'll mention it again. The New York Times referred to this book as the seminal book on power. The book won the Pulitzer Prize as well as the National Book Award. It was originally published in 1978. It was republished since then. And it is considered to be the Bible of leadership in this country. And so we've spent the last four weeks this particular graduate course and yesterday the third chat so we did six hours of live chats through the month of June as well uh, and this was envisioned in the grant as the capstone course and in, in, in other words the planning was that once we understood the founding and once we understood how the ideas and principles and ideals of the founders helped to inform the development of the country as it moved through the 19th century and through the 20th century and into the 21st, and how the Supreme Court interpreted the Constitution, and how that those interpretations tended to reflect changing circumstances as the nation developed, as the nation moved into the Industrial Revolution, but more specifically, as the nation has moved out of the Industrial Revolution and is now moving in the 21st century into what many people refer to as the information re revolution or the technological revolution. And of course we, we you know, paid considerable attention to um, uh, the, uh, the world is flat um, uh, study a book which was, you know, which is a prize winner about uh, about the extent to which technology has changed the whole international landscape within which the United States functions. 
uh, we know. <clears throat> in fact, we know very well because we're not doing that well in it. We know that as a result of technology, the, whole, the playing field has changed. And the advantages that citizens of the United States had in education and technology, in industrialism and all the rest of it that we enjoyed through so much of the 19th century, those advantages are gone. And what we ended up with is a situation where Americans now found themselves into a competitive struggle for jobs, for, for quality, uh, product quality and service quality, and our people have found themselves in competition with people from around the world. And what we find as we look at the statistics affecting our education system is that in many, many ways we're not doing too well in that competition. And so, you know, and we talk quite a bit about that on, on this program. The reason that I'm opening with this today about the PRISM grant program is because yesterday, effectively, it ended. <clears throat> it was the fourth year. We were funded for three, and we had enough money left over from the grant to actually fund the fourth year of the program. And, you know, we had a number of successes. And I'll be very honest with you, probably the most dramatic success we had is the audience that the Internet and head-on radio network has basically given us access to. And it would be remiss if I didn't point out the obvious, which is that the whole idea for this virtual center for the study of the Constitution this very program emerged as a result of that grant program and what happened as a, uh, you know, a, as a result of it. Basically, what, what I felt and what Bob Kincaid and the folks at Head On believed as well is that we found ourselves with a substantial number of people who had expressed through the, through the fact that they tune in to us a significant interest in this program, this, this subject. And the whole idea of the grant was basically to build understanding and appreciation, not only for the founders, and not only for the work that the founders created, whether it was the Declaration of the, or the uh, Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, or whatever, but general appreciation for the extent to which the historical setting, the, if you will, the context within which these kinds of issues unfolded, this seemed to be something that a lot more people were interested in than we ever had any idea about when we first began the grant. Naturally, the whole idea of the program itself out of the Department of Education in Washington was built on the idea that in order to expand appreciation and understanding of American history generally, and that was Senator Byrd, Senator Robert C. Byrd from West Virginia, who basically created, planted this seed on the need to beef up our understanding and appreciation of what he called traditional American history. We found on head-on through the Internet a whole group of people out there who were not K through 12 students any longer, who were not enrolled teachers in our program for academic credit, people who were generally interested in knowing more about and in discussing and sharing their ideas and thoughts about the political system in which we all live and, and, and seek to make it. And the, the idea of this program came directly out of that. It's very, very interesting, and I've shared this with, with our representative in Washington at the Department of Education but, uh, more than once. Every grant program that I've ever been familiar with at all 
seeks as one of its objectives that whoever receives the grant must address the issue of sustainability. In other words, what is there in the program, in the grant program, which is so important that it will live beyond funding when the money dries up, when the grant is over? What is there built into the program, into the grant program, that will continue the service being provided long after the funding is, is, is exhausted? If there was ever a grant that can emphasize sustainability, it was this PRISM West Virginia program. This very program on the Head On Radio Network, three afternoons a week, is indeed that sustainability. The course, the, the, the academic course that we are planning to launch in the fall, when, when schools reopen in this fall, where our local high school students here in this particular region of West Virginia are going to have the opportunity to take a three-year orientation to college, a college prep class on academic skills, on critical reading and writing and research and report writing and presentations and all of those things that are part of a quality, quality university education are going to be incorporated into this course. And this course is going to be offered to high school students throughout this region. It is not going to be offered to just the best students, the ones that already know they're going to college. The intent of this program is to serve students who are your traditional B- minus and C students, the ones that aren't sure whether they're going to college, aren't sure whether they can handle college. This course is designed to let them find out by ensuring that they have the skills that if they do decide to go to college, they're going to be ready. That also is part of the sustainability of the PRISM program because the course that these students, these high school students will be taking is modeled on the PRISM program. It will be all primary source materials. It will be all basically researching and, ri and writing original from original source materials and it'll focus principally on the founding the title of the course itself is going to be the founding of the American Republic it's going to cover from the colonial period up through independence through the Constitution into and through the Washington Adams and Jefferson's administration up to the end of the war of 1812 and 1815 the Treaty of Gent in 1815, which ended the War of 1812, is going to be the end of this course. It will be a year-long course, and it will focus principally on student skills. Students who take this course will read, and they will write, and they will discuss, and they will reflect. They will not regurgitate. They will not memorize. They will read, and they will discuss, and they will be involved in seminars with other people. And they will be, you know, uh, assigned to teams. And they will make team presentations on documents and portions of documents. This program will be co-sponsored by our local Chamber of Commerce here in Beckley, Raleigh County, as well as the Beckley Rotary Club. The Rotary Club has agreed to support the students who take this course for credit to the tune of 50% of their tuition, because the class will carry three university credits. 50% of the tuition will be paid by the Rotary Club. 50% will be borne by the students and their families themselves. To be, to be very straight about it, we believe, I believe, 
that students who have skin in the game will take the program much more seriously. <clears throat> so I was concerned about a program that would be totally funded by somebody else. For years, I have watched students who are on complete financial, federal financial aid of one kind or another, Pell Grants and various other things, not take their education as seriously as they could because they weren't paying for it. So it seemed to me very important that the students enrolled in this program have some investment in it. I think it'll cause them to take it more seriously. It'll cause their parents to be much more interested in what we're doing. All of this is in the category of sustainability from the PRISM West Virginia Grant Program. Now that the program is over, effective yesterday, all that's left, as far as the grant is concerned, is a final performance review to the federal government. And what that performance review focuses principally on are the teachers who took the courses for academic credit that were actively enrolled in the program. That's what the original grant addressed, and that's what the final performance review will emphasize. There is nothing in the final performance review guidelines from the Department of Education that includes this particular program or the course that will follow next academic year for high school students. All of that happened as a result of the program itself. It was not in the original planning. Therefore, it is not officially going to be in the performance review. It's going to be my job in putting together that final review which is due to at the end of the year. It's going to be my job to point out the extent to which the grant led to this, to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution, to the academic program that we're doing with our local high school students, and it's going to be over and above. But I, I, I think it's a very, very important part of the whole program. At the same time, I need to credit the teachers who, who stuck with us seem to be having a little cough, coughing issues today, and I'm sorry for that. The teachers who have stuck, stuck with us from beginning to end of this program. Uh, you know, I, this, this, is a, this is a separate program in and of itself, and I'm not going to do one at this point, but one, one of the negatives if the, you know, about this grant program, and, and, and I, ha I have to basically address this issue in the final performance review, involves the number of teachers who were enrolled in the program and for one reason or another dropped out. We have documentation of every teacher who withdrew from our program. And we have an indication in most cases as to why. Our teachers, like anybody else, and this involves all of us, have issues come up in their lives over a four-year period. Many of them are parents. In a couple of cases, they were grandparents. We had one teacher from an adjoining county who's one of the best teachers in southern West Virginia of history and political science. And he had a stroke at the end of the first year and was forced to withdraw from the program. We had another teacher who was honored as being the teacher of the year in the state of West Virginia a few years ago, who was forced to withdraw from the program because her husband became terminally ill and passed away last year. We had a number of teachers, and I think this speaks to the social situation in the country today. We had several teachers, more than you would know, more than you would believe, who ended up in situations where their children left home, got married, had families of their own, and then everybody moves back in with the, with the parents, who now are grandparents. We had a number of teachers who suddenly found themselves with a whole house full of people and grandchildren and everything else and just couldn't sustain make the you know handle the academic requirements of the grant program and and reluctantly made the decision that they would have to pull out 
I, you know, one, that's one of the things I learned through this grant thing. This happened to a number of our teachers, more than I would ever have believed. And it indicates how prevalent this issue of, of single-parent homes or stu young, young kids growing up and going to school and living with their grandparents rather than their, rather than their parents. And, of course, we all know the debate about, about two-parent homes and all the rest of it. Uh, and associated with the with the marriage issue, but the fact of the matter is, it's a real social problem. And I think you know it would we would be remiss if we don't if we don't deal directly and honestly with it. Fact of the matter is, while we had teachers who were forced to leave our program for very substantial reasons. We 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 had lost a number of teachers for reasons that aren't, re I don't think, uh, you know, at least from my perspective, they're not that substantial. I don't know what they are. They just decided they didn't want to do the work or it wasn't, the, the, the payoff wasn't worth the investment of time and energy that we were asking. On more than one occasion, I was directly approached by enrolled teachers in our program about the possibility of cutting back on the workload. I actually had a representative from one of our local education organizations that represents teachers come to my office and tell me that one of the reasons we were losing teachers out of our grant program is because I was requiring teachers to read. And our teachers in West Virginia worked so hard and were so busy that they didn't have time to read. For all practical purposes, I practically had to pick myself up off the floor on that one. Because <clears throat> all I could think about is, I don't, if a teacher isn't reading, I don't want a teacher teaching my children who doesn't, re who no, who doesn't read who basically has decided once they start to teach that they've read their last book. That's, that's, that's a little bit scary. That's part of the issue that the grant was addressing. Point is, we had a number of teachers who left for reasons which I don't know, they just stopped coming. They just didn't sign up, they, they, they stopped coming, and it was very obvious that the perks that we built into the program, the stipend, we gave them all Kindles, we bought all the textbooks, we paid for the tuition for all of the academic graduate credits in the courses that were being designed specifically for them. Those perks were apparently not enough to, to sustain a number of our teachers. So the fact of the matter is, the original grant anticipated that we would serve 90 teachers we are looking at issuing certificates of completion to 14 teachers, 14 out of 90. On anybody's radar screen, that's failure. And so one of the things that I will be doing in the final performance review this fall is addressing the issue of attrition, the number of teachers who began the program or for one reason or another did not finish it. A number of our teachers who did leave the program have been kind enough to communicate with us and give us documentation that we can use for the Department of Education on why they left, many of them for legitimate reasons. But that obviously doesn't apply to all of them. I've always all during the years that I've been teaching, I always looked at every student who began a class and withdrew from it as, in part, a failure on my part. Because I always believed that if I had done something a little bit better, I might have been, I might have made the course so much, uh, that much more interesting that this person would have not been inclined to leave. So I've always looked at, at attrition as a reflection on my teaching, and I've tried to, 
to address it as much as I can. The point I'm making, and I think it's very, very significant, um, is that this is, this is one of the downsides. This is one of the issues that I'm going to have to deal with in the grant. The upside is obviously this program and the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution, the academic program for high school students that we'll be doing in the fall, and all the rest of it. So, you know, I, 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 I approached yesterday, which was our final program, our final chat, with mixed emotions. And that's really what prompts me to begin today's program by addressing issues related to the grant. At the end of our program yesterday, Bob Kincaid, who was handling all the technology for us, asked a question with about five, ten minutes to go in the chat. And responding to that question is why we ran over by about 20 minutes. But Bob's point was that you really couldn't end the program yesterday, yesterday without doing some sort of summation or bringing it all together or trying to make some sort of a, of a uh, reaching some sort of a conclusion which would which for many people would would be closure on the entire program and of course what that involved is what were your successes and what were your failures and all the rest of it but content wise it also spoke to the nature of the courses themselves and the extent to which the course on leadership which we just which we just completing was really an appropriate way to end the prism west virginia grant program to what extent and that's one of the issues that i asked our teachers to address in their final papers to what extent were we were we correct in looking at leadership as a capstone course for this program as a way to bring the program to a logical meaningful conclusion to what extent has what they learned over the previous three and a half four years of this program contributed to a much deeper appreciation of leadership not only the attributes of leadership but the importance of leadership and more important than all of it the opportunities that await all of us dependent on the quality of leadership that can step forward and take us all to the next step in this ongoing saga which we call the United States of America I believe I've said this on on at least two occasions maybe more but it seems appropriate to say it once again I believe that the more I hear about American exceptionalism the more convinced I am that the basis of American exceptionalism is not connected to where we have come and what we have accomplished the extent to which America is an exceptional experiment, political experiment, the extent to which America is an exceptional nation, is contingent principally on what we do in the future. America is a work in progress. It is not a job completed. It is not, therefore, something that you can put a cap on by taking a snapshot in time. It is a work in progress. What makes America potentially ex exceptional <clears throat> is the potential for doing good that this political experiment brings to the, to the people of this country <clears throat> excuse me and the world I believe that America does have a mission it is the first nation in the history of the world to be creative 
with the welfare and the value of every individual as its priority. What America promises the world, as no other nation has been able to do ever, what America promises its citizens is opportunities that exist nowhere else. To give everybody a fair opportunity to realize their potential <clears throat> as a human being. To me, that is a mission, the pursuit of which makes this nation except exceptional. What scares me is that there were, there were <clears throat> excuse me, What scares me is that there are so many people who believe that America's best days are over, that we did it. These obviously tend to be the people who are living good, who have been successful, who are more than willing to look back and look over society and say, you did a good job, everything's fine, I'm where I want to be, I'm happy, I'm successful, fine. America is an exceptional nation for what it did for me. <clears throat> the reality is America is an exceptional nation, not only for what it did for you, but for what it promises to do for other people. And that mission, that commitment, is what ties all of us together as, an, as a political community. We are a community. We are all in this together. We all have obligations to each other. And the ideal is, if we successfully meet our obligations, not just to ourselves, but to our neighbors, to our brothers, so that they, in turn, are able to meet their potential. Then we indeed are an exceptional nation. I would suggest that whether in, which, whether in fact we go in that direction or not is one of the major issues that's on the table today in our politics. We have a number of people who want to praise America for what it has done. For a number of reasons, that's dangerous. It's kind of like getting a, getting a lead in, a, in, a, in an athletic event and then trying to sit on the lead and coast for the rest of the game. week before last, I watched the Stanley Cup, Stanley Cup Finals with the Boston Bruins and Chicago Blackhawks. And I watched the Boston Bruins, my team, try to do that. They were ahead 2-1 to one with very little time to go in the game. And if you ever saw a game in which they were trying to sit on the lead and coast into a victory in Game 6 of the seven-game series, it was that one. And Chicago, within a period of 17 seconds, was able to tie the game up, game up and go up by one goal. With only 58 seconds left, there was no way in the world that, that, that the Boston Bruins could recover. <clears throat> we have always heard, people have always been talking about the idea that you've got to continue to play the game in the same way that got you where you are now. You can't afford to sit in it and coast and try to wallow in the sunshine and the, and the glory of what you've already accomplished. Because we live in a world where there's always more to accomplish. There's always more to accomplish than we can realistically hope to accomplish. 
to sit back and dwell on our accomplishments at the expense of those who depend on us to make opportunities available for them is the worst thing that we can do. Unfortunately, that's the view of exceptionalism that too many people in today's world seems to have. <clears throat> to relate it to a, a, an issue that's very contemporary, very current, last week's Supreme Court decision striking down Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act based on the assumption that the South that existed in the 1960s when the Voting Rights Act was passed no longer exists. The South of today is not the South of the 1960s. In other words, there has been so much positive change in the racial situations in these targeted states and communities that the need for the Voting Rights Act under the terms in which it was originally passed is no longer justified. Basically, the implication is that racism in America has been, has been resolved successfully. We have, we have met the challenge. We have defeated the threat of racism in our society is the message that many people would get from the Supreme Court's decision last week in the case which struck down Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. The court was more than willing to concede that there could be conditions under which the Voting Rights Act would remain still viable, still necessary. But the conditions which existed in the early 60s when the act was initially passed no longer exist. And so the courts threw, it, threw the ball, if you will, threw the gauntlet to Congress and said it's up to Congress to come up and draft a new Section 4 which would establish new criteria that certain areas of the country would need to meet in order to fulfill the political obligations inherent in the Voting Rights Act, which is not to discriminate on the basis of, on the basis of race. One has to wonder whether what we are witnessing is a real success in our war against discrimination in our society or whether, in fact, we are falling, falling into the same psychological trap that the Boston Bruins fell into in the Stanley Cup Hockey Finals, which is trying to sit on a lead. Justice Ginsburg, in her dissent, in that particular decision made the point that if conditions have improved in these areas it is because of the Voting Rights Act and the requirements applied in that act to these particular areas so to remove that on the assumption that the conditions which originally called for it have been resolved her feeling is is naive. It's the same thing as putting down your putting away your umbrella in the middle of the rainstorm, but of a rainstorm, because you are not you have not gotten wet yet. Another example, of course, is 1937, when FDR kind of stood back and fell into the trap of giving in to those people who wanted to cut back on the New Deal program because it looked like we were making progress on unemployment in the, in the Great Depression. And by pulling back, the nation kind of fell back into the depths of the Depression that existed in 32, 33, and 34. Again, sitting on a lead. I would suggest that, that, we, really, that we really can't afford to do that. 
And so the the point, I guess, to to bring this whole issue to a conclusion, I didn't plan to spend an entire half of our program today on it, but effectively I have. <clears throat> Let me just say that as I look back on the PRISM program, I'm torn. I'm torn by the concerns, some of the challenges that we were not successful in, in meeting, but at the same time, I have to honestly address the fact that I think we really achieved some incredible successes. One of them is this program on the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution. Because if the purpose of the grant program initially was to expand, grow appreciation for the founders and for the work of the founders in terms of what they created, then it seems to me this program falls logically into that frame of reference. This is an example of sustainability that those who provide the money that the Department of Education specifically wanted to see in its grant program. And I think we've got it. What I And I haven't worked out the details yet, but what I'm anticipating this fall is that we will be able to link together the course being offered in the high schools with this particular program. We will be able to, to schedule programming in our time together that will be appropriate for the high school students who are taking this academic course. Consequently, they will become much more immersed in the issues and the discussions surrounding the constitutional system under which we live. But I also anticipating, anticipate developing assignments, designing assignments for students which are going to require that they come to us here on the Head On Radio Network in the programming on the Virtual Center. And they present to us their findings, their conclusions on particular issues that they have studied as part of this course so that not only will they derive benefit from what we talk about here at the Virtual Center, but all of us who tune in will derive benefit from what those students are doing and learning as a result of their exposure to the issues surrounding the Constitution of the United States. That's the plan. That's the goal. So again, I, I, I am I had to end yesterday's program, you know, w with mixed emotions. I feel good about the program. On the other hand, I really wish we had another round or another opportunity with some of those teachers that we lost, because I think they lost more than they gained by leaving. I, I believe that firmly. I trust that many of them realize that, but I also am aware that many of them don't realize that. And my concern is I won't have the opportunity to get them to realize it. So in that sense, I'm, I'm a little bit, you know, a, a little bit thrown aback. With that, I think uh, I'd like to uh, spend our second hour today addressing the issues of leadership that we talked about yesterday, which were part of this summation of the whole idea. In other words, what is the condition, the circumstances for leadership in this country? What are the opportunities available? What are, you know, what has been our experience as we look at leadership throughout the history of the nation? Where have been we been successful? Where have we been deficient? Are there opportunities still available as well as challenge for leaders? I think all of that is very, very relevant information because we, we cannot afford to be, you know, confused or misinformed by believing that because we have a participatory republic in which everybody, at least in theory, is encouraged and able to participate on an equal basis, 
we can't for a minute assume that this idea of individual equality that our society claims to stand for voids or vitiates the need for leadership. I think all of us need to consider that as an integral part of what our republic is about. We can begin to address some of that during our second hour today. But right now, let's pause and take a break. We have reached the top of the hour. And before we start our second hour, let's pause for four or five minutes and take a break. We'll be right back. I'm Bill O'Brien. Thank you for tuning in to today's version of the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution. After a four-minute break, we'll be right back. Please stay with us. Thank you, Bob Kincaid. It is a pleasure to be back. And if you are just joining us for today's edition of the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution, we thank you so very much for joining us. And if you've been with us through our first hour, I thank you for staying with us. Uh, I trust that your time will be worth the investment uh, of, you know, your willingness to, to invest time with us. I appreciate that very, very much. We'd love to hear from you. Our phone number, area code 304-658-3333. And my email address, waobrian906 at gmail.com. That's waobrian906 at gmail.com. At the end of our last hour, I had mentioned about the this last course that we did in our prison program on leadership. And I wanted to share with you some of the conclusions that we reached uh, in our in our discussions yesterday. Um, it was not just me; it was Keith Lilly, Bob Kincaid, um, and we were kind of kicking around. I I think some really very very serious issues, not just about leadership in the abstract, but more importantly about leadership in our political system, what it involves, what the founders envisioned. There's absolutely no question. If you think back, and you know, to where, to where we've been in previous programs, it was very obvious to many of the founders that education was going to be a key as to whether, in fact, the idealism that was associated with American independence would or could be realized. <clears throat> There was, there was tremendous idealism and optimism among many of the founders. Some of them were skeptical, Hamilton being the most, the most obvious, Tench Cox of Philadelphia, and a few others. But most people in 1776 were extremely optimistic, extremely idealistic about the potential for independence and what it, what it could mean and what it should mean for the people of this nation. And that that is essentially it, it, it seemed to me one it seems to me one of the most one of the most important issues. And there's no question that it is within the context of that particular of that idealism that the founders operated as they tried to implement a political structure which would fulfill the ideals that many of them had associated with independence. And we've been through, over in the previous weeks, a, a lot of, and we've looked at the Federalist Papers and we've looked at some of the negativism and cynicism, <clears throat> excuse me, on part of some of the founders associated with attitudes towards things like human nature, for example. You remember in much of the writing that James Madison himself did, it, he was conflicted because at the, at the same time that he was optimistic about the potential, he also was forced to deal with what he considered to be the realities of human nature. When he said in Federalist Number 10 that factions are sown into the nature of man, By factionalism, I, I you know he he mentioned a number of things. Political science usually scientists usually 
refer to it as interest groups. But the fact of the matter is, probably the, the, thing, the term that captures it best is self-interest. Madison himself said that as long as human nature is driven by self-interest, and as long as man is free to pursue it, and as long as man has a mind which provides him the opportunity to be to calculate and to come up with ways to satisfy that self-interest, as long as the connection between self-interest and reason exists, there will be factions. There will be people who will find a way to link up with other people who have the same self-interest that they have, knowing full well that there's strength in numbers. And in a popular government, in a participatory government, the louder the voice you can raise, the more people you are able to bring into the fold. Theoretically, the more effective you will be in fulfilling your objectives. And so Madison's whole strategy in the Constitution was to try to design a system that would be stable and secure in the face of this kind of self-interested interest group building. In fact, one of the major political scientists of our, of our era one of the most noted political scientists you know in recent years is V O Key last name spelled Key K E Y and Key actually introduced the idea of what he termed for lack of a better term interest group democracy and without going into detail on this particular theory let me just briefly explain what V.O.K.'s position was. He was very aware and responding to the criticism, the cynicism that came from people who realized that the ideals of an open democratic system in which everybody theoretically was equal Everybody had an equal voice. Everybody's influence was equal because we were all equal citizens under the nation. We all lived under the rule of law. To assume, V.O.K. said, that the ideals of, democratic, of a democratic system would be fulfilled is naive. There was too much evidence to believe that. Everybody knows that certain people have more influence and more clout than other people. Some people are more assertive. Some people have more money. Some people, because of their position, are able to wield much more influence than others. Some people have very strong personalities. Some people are much better connected than our other people. In other words, some people know the people they need to know in order to get what they want. The point of, re the point of fact is that it, it would be naive, and V.O.K. agrees with this 100%. There's no way in the world to argue realistically that we can set up a society in which everybody's going to have the same influence and the same power as everybody else. Everybody's vote counts the same. But that doesn't mean that everybody's influence over decision-making is the same. And VOK recognizes that. Does that mean, then, that the ideals of the American Republic are unattainable? Absolutely not, says VOK. Key's position is that what makes American government tick 
what makes American government operate is the reality of interest groups. The very factions that Madison warned us about in Federalist Number 10. The fact that factions are sown into the nature of man, the O'Key believes, suggests that they aren't necessarily threats to the existence of our political democracy. And I'm using the word democracy here in the in, you know in a very generic in a very general sense, not in a specific sense. Key's position is that rather than interest groups or factions being a threat to our political system, Key argues that they are the very essence of our political system. In other words, V.O. Key is writing 100% in tune with Madison's Federalist Number 10. Because if you remember, Madison's position is since factions are sown into the nature of man and since we can't do anything to eliminate them because we can't take away people's freedom nor can we make everybody want and believe the same things we can't indoctrinate everybody into believing the same thing and having the same wants and needs So, in a sense, the two strategies for eliminating factions are unworkable, Madison concludes. You can't take away people's freedom, and you can't make everybody exactly the same. So, consequently, you cannot eliminate factions. Therefore, our alternative must be to find a way to regulate their effects to make sure that even though factions are with us, they will be unable to exert their influence over the rest of us. Or as Madison referred to it, their plans of oppression. And of course we know that the faction that worried Madison the most was the majority faction. B. O. Key's theory thesis is that it is the existence of these factions that becomes the measure of how democratic, how equal, how how well our political system is functioning. To him, the key is people's freedom to organize factions, to join factions that were organized by other people. As long as people are free to belong to interest groups and to have those interest groups operate, to give them an opportunity to influence decision-making in government so that they, they can hire lobbyists and they can get their position or their point of view before decision makers in government. As long as the system of within which interest groups must operate is open and unrestricted, America's democratic system is oper- is working. In other words, American democracy is not measured by the operation of individual or the, the, uh, the opportunities available to individual citizens. It is measured by the opportunities available to organized interest groups. And V.O. Key's position is that where our system goes off the track is when we make it impossible for certain interest groups to be heard. We censor them. We, we render them illegal. We do not allow them to offer their point of view on the issues 
that make them an interest group. We do not give them an opportunity to introduce their thinking into the marketplace of ideas. In other words, if you silence their voice, if you deny them access to the marketplace of ideas, if you deny them access to the media, if you do not let them compete equally with other interest groups, then to be okay, that's when we are violating our ideals, our principles. But as long as we are free to belong to interest groups and to have those interest groups function and to put forth our self-interest, our democracy is intact. That's VOK's position. If you accept that, and I do, I, I think there's absolutely no question that our system is a system which functions around organized interest groups. All you have to do is look at the number of, of lobbyists in Washington. Look at K Street in Washington, the offices of all these different lobbyists that represent all of these various interest groups, corporations, companies, uh, unions, uh, professional groups of one kind or another, medical groups, etc. So there's no question that we, you know, what we have, what we have before us, what we have been, the hand we have been dealt by Madison and by the founders is a constitutional system that was set up to meet the threat of interest groups. And the system that was created is one which absolutely depends on them. Our system thrives on the competition between factions. The only danger, Madison said, is when factions are able to put aside their differences and all come together and unite and create a majority faction. Because our system is vulnerable to majorities. And Madison said, the greatest threat of a majority faction is the organization of the poor, the majority faction based on property ownership. Those with and those without, without property. And Madison says throughout history, it's the people without property who have organized them. When they are effectively able to organize and operate within the parameters of an open participatory government or republic like ours, our system is directly vulnerable to the rule of that group, to majority rule. And so Madison's whole constitutional system was organized to prevent the existence of such a faction. But the fact of the matter is, what we are left with then is a variety of competing factions and competing interest groups. And V.O. Key's position is that our system's democracy is measured by how free and open access to these interest groups and their access to decision makers in government happens to be. If everything is open and if people can freely maneuver and put forth their point of view and be heard and have their ideas heard and all the rest of it, then American democracy is functioning as it should. That's VOK's position. And if you accept this, as, as I am I'm back to where, where I was a few minutes ago, if you accept the reality of faction, of interest group politics, interest group government, then it seems to me the whole idea of leadership becomes absolutely critical. Because somebody's going to lead these groups. Somebody's going to sketch out the strategies that these groups should follow. And so all the attributes of leadership, the psychology of leadership, the sociology of leadership, the morality of leadership, all of it comes to the fore during our, 
you know, within the context of our political system, within the framework that the founders gave us. So the point that I would make, and this is the point that James McGregor Burns makes in his book on leadership, is that by definition, leadership is always culture-bound. It's always the product of the particular culture, the particular priorities within which it emerges. And leadership becomes whatever the context within which it must function requires it to become. Given the operations of our political system, then, the ingredients of leadership become particularly important. And they are obviously tied, not totally, but directly, to our education system. Because part of the opportunities available to citizens in our society is the opportunity to lead. And as long as access to leadership is open to everybody, then it seems to me our system thrives on its ability to educate and generate the kind of leaders that will make this system work. And conversely, our system will suffer on the extent to which this idea of the American dream in terms of leadership is not open to everybody. What our founders gave us is a republic based on the free and un unregulated or uncontrolled ability of interest groups to operate freely within the context of our political process. A system which makes leadership a priority, but it is a leadership which is designed by the political context within which it functions. And what James McGregor Burns argues is within that context, there are two major kinds of leadership. There's what he calls transform, transformational leadership. Leadership that aims to transform, to change. And then there is transactional leadership, which is the give and take of day-to-day, of day-to-day leadership. In other words, what do I get out of belonging to this particular group? And if I'm trying to build the group, what can I offer people who are willing to join us? So always on the table is what do people gain from this? What are the, you know, what are the costs? What are the benefits? And so that, to James McGregor Burns, is transactional leadership. And the effective leader within that context is the one who can make the case and bring people in and keep people loyal and keep people involved in the objectives of the goals of the group. And how effective the leader is in doing that determines the overall effectiveness of that particular group. But then there is the other kind, the transformative kind of leadership. It's the kind of leadership that sets out to produce major change. That is is not just trying to lobby for a bigger piece of the action under the existing pie, so to speak. But transformational leadership is the kind of leadership that is focused on producing systemic change. In most cases, its focus is principally on opening up the system to people who, for one reason or another, have been excluded from it. Again, we, 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 we run into another issue that is critically, critical to understanding the nature of our political system. In order for our participatory political republic to work, it needs to be inclusive rather than exclusive. The priority is bringing as many people as possible into it never to find ways to deny people access to it. 
throughout our history a major theme is the process of those who for whatever reason are excluded from the political process to gain inclusion. We saw it in the civil rights movement. We saw it in the women's movement. We are seeing it today in the whole issue of gays and transgender folks. One of the drawbacks, one of the negatives of our political system historically has been contrary to its mission, contrary to its ideals and its principles. We are a society that throughout its history, in one way or another, have excluded certain groups of people. Originally, for example, at the beginning, at the, you know, at the point of the founding in the, in the 18th century, most, most colonies, and then right after independence, became states. Most of them required or established property qualifications for voting and office holding. The idea being that if you didn't own property, you could not be trusted because you didn't have what many scholars have referred to as a stake in society. You didn't have a vested interest. You didn't have, a, you didn't have any skin in the game. I mentioned that earlier when I was talking about the course, the, the academic course that we're hoping to be able to run this fall and the fact that I wanted to make sure that the students who enrolled in the program had some skin in the game, that they put up a portion of their own tuition. And the reason is because if they have an investment in the process, then they tend to be much more serious about the process itself. This is a throwback to the old idea of the stake in society principle. The basis of it is that those who have property have a vested interest in what happens. They have skin in the game. They will be better citizens. They will be more informed citizens. They will be more engaged in what government is doing because they've got something to lose if things don't go well. So the mere fact that they have a vested interest or a stake that they have skin in the game, so to speak, makes them better citizens. That theory operated in Great Britain. It operated in the colonies of the New World. It was brought over here intact. And the basic idea was that the only people who could be trusted with the vote were people that owned a certain amount of property. Because in owning a certain amount of property, they had a vested interest or a stake in political decision making. They became more actively involved, more engaged, more intelligent citizens who knew what the issues were because they had something to lose. The belief was that people who didn't have property, people who had, no, who had nothing to lose because they didn't own anything, were very potentially very dangerous because their number one priority was to take property from somebody else. You had to be very suspicious of the very poor. In a society where property was the measure of one's status and one's importance as a person, you had to look very, very carefully at those without any property because they were basically untrustworthy. They were, the time, they were the kind of people that would support any scheme or, or program 
that would be you know that that would be aimed at giving them access to property, whether it was somebody else's or not. The worst thing you could do would be to give them the vote. It made no sense at all to give voting power to people who had everything to gain by change and nothing to lose if that change didn't work, if, it, if things didn't go well. It's almost like bankrolling a player in a poker game. The player is not going to bet intelligently if he's playing with, with unlimited sources of money from somebody else. He's going to gamble. He's going to risk because he has nothing to lose. That principle drove Western society. And every single colony, every single state began its existence as a state in the late 18th century with enacted property qualifications for voting and office holding. And we've talked about voting. What about office holding? If you were going to be a candidate for office, then not only was it important that you own property, but the reasoning was all of us would be better off if you owned a lot of property. The assumption being that those with the most property had the most to lose. Therefore, they were the ones that we could rely on to make the best decisions. If they had more property than we did, it probably meant that they were more intelligent than we are. At least, clearly, they were more successful than we are. But the reality is they had more to lose than we did. So they had a vested interest in making quality decisions. Therefore, if they had a lot of property and I only had a little, my property was safer in their hands than it probably would be in mine. They probably know what's best for me better than I do because they've got more skin in the game than I have. And so the sum total of this is that in every colony, in every state, everybody had to have a minimum amount of property to vote. You had to be able to demonstrate that you were worth a certain amount in order to vote. And depending on the office, the elected office that you wanted to run for, you had to have an escalating amount of property depending on the, 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 the importance of the office. The state that I'm most familiar with, because I wrote my dissertation on it, is Maryland. In Maryland, you had to have property valued at 50 British pounds in order to vote. In order to run for elected office, either at the municipal level or at the state level, for members of the legislature, for example, you had to be, you had to be worth at least 100 pounds of property. In order to be a candidate for the Senate, the upper house of the Maryland legislature, which was, continued, which was considered to be reserved for the aristocrats, the upper class, the nobility. <coughs> Excuse me. You had to be able to demonstrate that you were, you were valued, you, you were worth more than 500 pounds. And if you wanted to be a candidate for governor, you had to be worth at least 1,000 pounds. And the point, the numbers aren't important. The point is, the more important the office the more you had to be worth based on the principle of the stake in society idea. So in a sense, going back to the, to the, to the basic point here, society, the way society operated at the time of the Declaration of Independence was in large part exclusionary. Those without property were excluded from decision-making, from power. And so, logically, the use of the term democratic from that point on was associated in people's minds 
with who could participate and who doesn't and who couldn't. The idea being society became more democratic as more people were allowed to participate in it. The first major change, the major democratic push in the, in the American in, in the United States in its early years was the elimination of property qualifications for vote, voting and office holding. And by the time you got early in the 19th century, by the time you got to Jackson, for example, Jackson was elected in 1828. By the time you got into the 1820s, most states had, ab had abolished requirements for vo voting requirements based on property ownership. Most people could vote. And, of course, part of it was the availability of land. Jefferson's purchase of Louisiana was based on the fact that he effectively doubled the land mass of the United States. And if you read Jefferson after the Louisiana Purchase, he basically believed that he had guaranteed the stability of America for generations to come because of the availability of property that the Louisiana Purchase had brought to the table in America. He believed that the ownership of property was the basis of a secure, orderly society. In Europe, he believed, turmoil, revolutions were created when you had large numbers of people denied access to property. When you had large numbers of propertyless people, most of them concentrated in cities, in large cities, you were creating the, the basis of revolution. Jefferson's position was we will remain stable and we will remain secure from internal discord as long as we remain an agricultural nation, a nation of farmers. As long as the bulk of our citizens are laboring on the land and growing their own food and have access to property, then we are guaranteed a stable, secure society. People's freedom is guaranteed. It is when you have large numbers of propertyless people, poor people, who have nothing to lose, who become desperate. That's when you are facing the risk of turmoil. And so the whole issue of leadership we come back to the issue of leadership again. If there are growing numbers of poor people, what do you do about leaders within those groups? The effectively, I guess what I'm saying, is effectively the security and stability of the nation is determined by the availability of property. Different term, the availability of opportunity. We are a nation from the very beginning that was built around the idea of go west, young man, go west. <clears throat> if you're not making it here, you could always pick up and go somewhere else and start again because there was always land available, there was always opportunity available. And as long as opportunity continued to exist for the vast number of citizens, then your society remains stable. So in a sense, this is another term that is very, very important in understanding early American history. The availability of property becomes a key ingredient in the maintenance of stability in society. In a sense, the West serves as a safety valve. If you think of a boiler, 
where if you increase the heat, you increase the flame, the boiler becomes hotter and hotter and hotter. And if you don't open a valve so that the steam can escape, it will explode. The founders saw society the same way. If you had large numbers of propertyless people with no vested interest in the society or what the society stood for, and no place to go, no opportunities available, you were risking revolution. Because if you have large numbers of dissatisfied people who can't satisfy their needs and their wants, then they have no choice but to turn on the government itself, to turn on society, to so turn on society's most successful people. If property is the measure of success in society and you can't acquire any, then it doesn't take long before you begin to realize that your best chance is to find ways to take property away from people who have it, who have more than they need, perhaps. Remember Madison's Federalist Number 10 when he said, that the major challenge of government is to regulate the differences in society in property ownership. The potential hostility between those who own and those who are without property, Madison said, have ever caused problems in popular governments. So the point is, the availability of property becomes a safety valve. It becomes the way that social pressure is released, which is why people have asked the question for, for generations. Why is it that the United States of America has not experienced the same kind of violence, the same kind of of turmoil internally. Why haven't we had something like the French Revolution in American society? We have plenty of poor people. We, we, we open our, our shores and invite people from all over the world to come here as immigrants. They have nothing, many of them. How have we been able to do that and not experience revolution? And the answer to that question is the availability of opportunity the whole idea of equality of opportunity. As long as opportunity continues to exist, then there are always places for people to go. There's always an alternative for people than the most obvious one of turning on the system or taking from people who have what you want. In 1893, a professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison named Frederick Jackson Turner. Some of you may remember this from years and years ago in your, in your grade school history classes. It used to be written a lot, especially if the textbook was one in which there were chapters on the West. But Frederick Jackson Turner, is most he, was a, he was a professor at the University of Wisconsin in the history department. And in 1893, he delivered a very influential paper, which was entitled the, the Significance of the Frontier in American History. Think about that. The Significance of the Frontier in American History. And his paper basically addressed the following the extent to which the existence of the frontier in America had been the determining driving factor in the value system that emerged in America up to the end of the 19th century. America's value, the value that Americans placed on individual freedom, on toughness, 
on independence, on the ability of people to do for themselves and take care of themselves and not look for handouts, not go to government. And Turner's argument is it's the classic example of how people made it on the frontier. The people that literally confronted the wilderness. The people who brought civilization to the wilderness. They chopped down trees, they built homes, they grew their own food, they raised their own animals, they raised their, you know, raised their own food, they became independent, their wives sewed and knitted and they made their own clothes, etc., etc., etc. This kind of independence, Turner argued, was a direct result of the existence of the frontier in American society. And his idea basically is much of what we know about what being an American means, much of what Alex de Tocqueville taught us in his travels through America in the early 19th century about what he saw here, what Americans were about, what made Americans tick. Much of that was directly attributable to the existence of the frontier. And the question that Turner raises in 1893 is that by the end of the 19th century, there really isn't any more frontier. America has moved as far west as it can go. And the question he raises in his paper on the significance of the frontier is now that there's no more frontier, now that there's no more wilderness to conquer, what's going to happen to our nation? Will we begin to implode internally? Now that that safety valve is gone, what will we do? Historically, we know what we did because the 1890s was the point at which America began seriously to take on the issue of acquiring overseas possessions. It's in the 1890s that we acquire Hawaii and Guam and the Philippines in the, in the Spanish-American War in 1898. America becomes imperial. America becomes the owner of an empire at the end of the 19th century. And many people believe that America's overseas expansion at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th is merely a different phase of Turner's frontier. And what our foreign policy objectives became in this time was to actively develop clones of ourselves around the world. And the idea being with the Industrial Revolution happening, we were finding new markets and new sources of raw materials around the world to keep the American enterprise afloat. And so opportunity continued. The availability of opportunity was still there. It was just not in the form of land. It was in the form of economic growth and economic expansion. And America becomes, you know, ends up being an imperial nation. And Turner's position was that this was the only way that we could effectively confront the realities of the fact that the frontier was effectively closed. In 1890, in the, in the census of 1890, remember the Constitution has a provision in it that every 10 years Congress will, will conduct a census and count the number of people in America. In the census of 1890, the conclusion was that the frontier as we have known it no longer exists. And that's when Turner wrote his paper, 1893. So it's fascinating, you know, it, it, you know, because this is the idea of individual freedom and all the rest of it. And it ties directly with the whole concept 
of leadership. All of it helps define the ingredients of the leadership that will be most effective within our society. How do you develop a definition of leadership which will be realistic and can function in this kind of a setting, in this kind of an environment, with these particular values and principles? We're still talking about the founders. And we are talking about the kinds of ingredients in our development that allow the values and the principles that the founders brought to the table and put into operation in our Declaration of Independence and in our Constitution, we have continued to find ways to keep those values and principles alive. The principal one, James Madison reminded us, being freedom, that's the one you can't tamper with. Madison says to take away people's freedom is a, is a cure worse than the disease. And so all of this helps to define leadership in our society. So therefore, the kind of leadership that we are looking for is the kind of leader that's going to emerge from and help to perpetuate the value system that becomes the Republic of the United States. It seems to me that what we are talking about is the nature of the society and the political system that will best support the realities laid out in the Constitution of the United States. And it is within that context that we have to look at leadership. What I'd like to do tomorrow, we are at 57 minutes after the hour, we've reached the end <clears throat> excuse me, of our day today. I apologize for this clearing my throat. I, I hope I'm not coming, uh, getting a little cold. But the point that I would make is that wh what I would like to do tomorrow is begin to look at the whole issue, uh, at this whole issue again, looking specifically at the, at the idea of equality of opportunity and even more specifically at the ways that we have tried to find ways to include those that heretofore were excluded. We talked about the people without property in the early years of the nation. It seems to me we need to, and of course the major one becomes slavery. Becomes the existence by the time you get to 18, the 1870s and 1880s. You're talking about the, you know, approximately 8 million black African Americans living, residing in the United States of America. How do you find a way to include them into the American body politic? Because if you don't, Booker T. Washington told us in 1895, the potential of the South is unlimited. But if the South tries to develop and continue to exclude black Americans, African Americans, from inclusion, then we will become like dead weight. The self will go nowhere because we will be an anchor holding it back. But as Washington said, if you are willing to include us and let us partic participate as equal citizens in the American experiment, then Book Washington told the, le the white leaders of the South, the self-potential is unlimited. And we know with segregation and Jim Crow from the end of the 19th century through much of the 20th century that most southern states made the decision that their racial policies of excluding black Americans were more important than the economic potential of including them. And one of the results of that, his, of that decision, of those decisions, was the Voting Rights Act of 1964. So we come back to where we started. And it is 59 minutes after the hour. So I want to thank you for being with us today. Please come back tomorrow. This is Bill O'Brien for the Virtual Center on the Study of the Constitution. Stay tuned for Bob Kincaid on the Head On Radio Network. Have a good evening.